here today to talk to you in a high level way about the design of retaining walls. Uh, but before I start, I would like to have a safety moment. As engineers, we're involved in building structures, uh, digging holes and so on, and we must do this safely. And here are some photos of some examples where some unsupported excavations have not been safe. Fortunately, no one was hurt or injured in any of these uh, excavations. They are all in rock, uh, but all occurred suddenly and with disastrous consequences, certainly for the two on the left hand, on the right hand side of the screen, uh, for the projects involved, uh, and the one on the on the left uh, was a lift overrun pit where uh, people could have been, or workers could have been injured, similarly for the other ones. Unfortunately, no one was, but I would encourage you that when you're doing design for excavations and for retention systems, that you think about the safety in design, about how you're actually going to build this practically and safely. So what I'm gonna talk about uh, in this presentation is, as I said before, to give, is give you a high level appreciation of things you need to take into account when you're designing retaining walls. What the first thing we have to remember is retaining walls are a way of permanently steepening the ground. We're taking a situation which is inherently stable, something which is relatively flat. We're either adding an embankment or we're cutting a hole, excavating a hole. So we're standing up soil and rock slopes which are steeper than they want to stand. And so that you're taking something from being a stable situation to something which is being unstable. Now, so you have to be able to design this such that you can prevent unnecessary or unexpected movements of the ground. The other thing which happens with retaining walls is especially when you excavate, there's water in the ground. So you have to deal with this. And whether there is water there uh, or not can greatly impact the performance of the wall. Many engineers, when they come to designing retaining walls, simply apply generic um, designs and properties straight out of textbooks. You can't do that with retaining wall. You have to take everything on its merits. You have to do a proper ground investigation, understand the properties, understand the ground, understand the water conditions. You have to understand the impacts of doing that or building that retaining wall or excavation or the embankment is going to, how it's going to impact the ground, how it's going to impact the groundwater, what temporary support you're going to need. You need to understand the long-term performance of the wall. And in many, many cases, these are not considered appropriately. Because of this, you end up with a poor choice of retaining wall system type. Uh, you can have significant oversights with respect to occupational health and safety, especially under temporary conditions. You can get instability or you can get excessive movement. Both instability and excessive movement are forms of failure. One thing you must remember, a retaining wall is not only a fascia. A fascia provides no support. It is what is behind the wall uh, that provides support or the structural system which makes up the wall, which provides the support. It is not the facing blocks. So before you start going about designing a retaining wall, you need to think about what you are going to do to the ground. If you're going to excavate into a slope for a basement, you are going to take soil weight out of the ground. So you're going to unload the ground. So the ground is going to move in response to that unloading. So you're going to get heave of the floor and you're going to get inward movement of the walls, even under a stable situation. When we do a fill, we're placing more load on the ground. So you compress the ground, you can get settlement and bearing capacity failure if you don't do it properly. So both of those conditions, they're very different and you have to design for them differently. In, under both circumstances, you can get stable movements of the ground which just means you get, which you have to consider as serviceability, but stable movements can be too much. But you can also get unstable movements where you get complete collapse. And that is a situation which is even worse. The other thing we must remember is excavation, especially down into the existing ground, 
can cause changes in the groundwater uh, and, and how the groundwater flows, how it comes into the site, how it affects around the site. So you must take into account the groundwater effects. It's no good just to put it in a retention system without uh, understanding the effects of groundwater, how you're either going to stop the groundwater coming in or how you're going to deal with it if it does come in. So it's important that how does the retaining wall impact the surrounding ground, nearby structures because of possible movements, road services, buildings and other assets. So how will the ground respond? Well, in the worst case, you can get retaining wall failure simply because the forces that the ground exerts on the retaining wall are just too high. You can get excessive uh, settlement of the wall and behind the wall simply because the stresses you're releasing uh, or imposing by uh, either building an embankment or uh, cutting into the ground cause movements. And so you must be able to, to understand what those movements or estimate those movements to make sure they're not going to be too great. And you can change the groundwater flow regime. In the, in the case here on the right hand side, there's a situation here where there was an underlying aquifer under the retention system. It caused the bottom of the excavation to blow in and uh, not only would you've got a good chance of losing the whole excavation and causing collapse, you've got consolidation of the ground around which can affect other buildings for quite a long distance away. Under certain conditions, you can affect buildings up to a kilometre away just from doing one reasonably deep hole. So what do we need to consider when we're designing a retaining wall? Obviously you need to, to consider the height of the retained soil. You need to understand the ground strength. You need to understand the ground compressibility and stiffness because these are going to impact on the stable movements. You have to think about the available space you've got to be able to build the wall. You've got to think about the construction impacts and the temporary works. What are the, the temporary batters going to be? How, how steep can I stand those without them being unstable in, in themselves? You've got to think about how close you are to sensitive settlement sensitive services or buildings, historic buildings, um, old water mains, that type of thing. And of course, you've got to come back to groundwater, the effect of groundwater. So you need to use, consider all these to select a retaining structure that is safe and practical to build. It also has to suit the application, including the design life of the structure. It's got to be suitable for the geology you're building it in. It's no good picking a wall which you can't build practically because of the geology and the groundwater regime and protects the adjacent assets uh, and of course human life. So I've talked about embankments and excavations, two very different applications for retaining walls. And here I've just got a simple table where I try and group them. So with respect to engineering or the design of embankments, it's relatively easy. It's relatively straightforward. You just have to make sure you, uh, that you don't um, cause bearing capacity failure. Uh, and that's really about it. You've got to prepare your foundation right and so on. But it's relatively straightforward engineering. Excavations are risky. They're misunderstood and abused. And most of the problems we have with ex come with excavations and the retention of. The type of wall uh, you have, it, for an embankment, the wall can be built as you build up the embankment. So there's no real temporary work. So as, a, as the embankment height increases, so does your wall. With excavation, you have to put the supporting structure replaces the existing ground so you've either got to get the supporting structure in first before you dig the hole, or you've got to dig temporary batters, and that's what makes it risky. Construction, embankment's relatively low risk. There's still risk, but it's relatively low risk. Construction, on the other hand, for excavations is relatively high risk, because we are now providing a situation from a stable to an unstable situation, potentially unstable. With embankments, the material which we are supporting is usually engineered fill which is the properties are generally well known, they're relatively uniform and they're constant fairly well over time. 
excavations, you're dealing with natural unengineered materials, which are variable. They're largely unknown and properties change with time. When we do an excavation, we generally do the boreholes within the site, not outside the site. So we know the ground conditions within the site, but not behind the site where the soil is providing the load on the wall. Groundwater for embankments is usually not an issue because you're usually building above the ground surface. Groundwater for excavation is a major issue, whether it's water tightness or dealing with drainage and how much volume of water you're gonna get in and how you discharge it. So let's just go back to some basic theory. The, the ground has pressures in it, both horizontal and vertical. And everyone basically understands vertical pressure because it's just the weight of the soil above you. But what is the horizontal pressure? And in soil mechanics, we can understand horizontal pressure and we can actually relate horizontal pressure to vertical pressure by what's called a earth pressure coefficient. Now, when, if I have a thought experiment and I put a plate into the ground and I could measure the horizontal stress acting on this plate, we call that as a, it's a function of the vertical stress and we call that K naught or the at rest earth pressure coefficient. And the earth pressure coefficient for various soils is generally in this range of about zero to one. It can be higher, especially in rocks. It can get up five, six, seven, and so on. It can get really high. But in soils, it's somewhere around here. And so that is the pressure in the soil as it appears at the moment. And so there's zero displacement. At the moment, this soil has not been displaced. If we move to what's called an active situation where we excavate on one side of that plate, the soil on the, on the right-hand side pushes the plate and the plate resists the movement. And so this is an active situation. The soil's doing all the work, it's pushing. It's called the active earth pressure coefficient Ka. Now to get that, measure that pressure, you have to get movement, but you don't need very much movement to get Ka to mobilise. So you'll find the, the horizontal stress in the soil here will move from the K naught position over to the Ka, and it only takes a very small displacement. Now we use this Ka in, in retaining wall analysis because it defines one of our driving forces, what's causing the instability. If we move the other way and we try to push the plate back into the soil like a bulldozer blade pushing soil, the pressure you have to, you have to uh, force or, or use to push that soil is a lot higher. And it's called the passive earth pressure coefficient. And it's called Kp. But it is a much higher pressure, but it takes a lot more displacement to mobilise. We use this to resist retaining wall movement. But when you use these values, you have to understand that the Ka mobilised much before the Kp. So to be able to resist the soil, you have, there has to be a certain amount of movement and it's going to be more movement than you're allowed to, or you need to mobilise Ka. The other thing to remember is that Ka and Kp for soils, active and passive earth pressures, are maximum and minimum earth pressures. They are the maximum and minimum values that can exist in that ground. They can't be any higher or any less. They're failure conditions. So that at least brackets the pressure you can put or apply to a soil. So this is a bit of a busy slide, but it, I just wanted to help you understand what these earth pressure coefficients mean. K naught active earth, pre oh, sorry, earth pressure coefficient at rest is not a soil property. It's not something, you can go out and measure it, but the same soil in a different situation will have a different K naught. It depends on the stress history, the geometry, the reactivity of the clay, and many other things. It is usually unknown, but it's important we try and estimate it because it it defines how much movement we're going to have. It's going to lie somewhere between Ka and Kp, which are the failure states, but we don't know where. We can make an estimate of it, and that's part of the engineer design. On the other hand, Ka and Kp can be reasonably estimated for a soil. Very hard to estimate for a rock, 
Um, but it can be estimated for a soil. The reason it's hard to estimate for a rock is rocks have lots of discontinuities in it, bedding planes, fractures, joints, which change the, make it very difficult to estimate these values. When you're estimating KA and KP for the geotechnical engineers in the audience, you need to use saturated drain strengths. And to do this, you need quality, effective stress triaxial tests or something similar. It's no good using quick undrained tests because they are not an effective stress test and you cannot get these properties from a quick undrained test. The only exception is, is when you're doing retaining walls in soft clay, then you might want to use a quick undrained test to get, uh, use the, so you get the undrained strength of the clay. The other thing to do is the active and passive earth pressure for coefficients depend a lot on the cohesion strength parameter. Cohesion is inherently variable and you shouldn't rely on it too much. And for low height retaining walls, it dominates the strength. So much so that if you have 10, kp, 10 kPa cohesion, you can dig a hole two metres deep, vertically unsupported, and you'll have no active, um, no active pressure acting on the wall. So you don't need any support. But of course that might collapse over time. So the cohesion you are seeing there is a false cohesion. It's a suction, like in a clay. And it's a suction which is actually holding the wall, the clay from collapsing. The other thing which you must remember is that, as I've said before, the design earth pressures depend on how far the wall moves. So if you've got a very rigid wall, it's going to have an earth pressure on it close to K0. If you have a very flexible wall, it's going to have a pressure on it close to Ka. If you put very high anchor forces on a wall and try and pull it back into the soil, you're going to have something higher than K0. So what you actually design for uh, depends on the design. So there's two different types of retaining wall systems. There's passive systems and active systems. Let's just look at passive systems, which include gr gravity walls, cantilever walls, reinforced earth walls, soil nail walls, uh, bolted rock walls, and so on. And there's a few examples showing here. The, res the restraining force is developed by the soil pushing against a large gravity block, just a heavy structure, which then relies on friction to stop that block movement. So, but you must have movement of the wall for the wall to work. We generally only design these walls for stability only, and they're generally designed to resist the lowest earth pressure, generally active earth pressure. We have to be careful in swelling soils because if you've got reactive soils and the, the soil uh, wets up, you can get expansive forces which are great higher, much higher than Ka and you can move your wall further. These types of walls should only be moved where movements are not a real issue. You can't, build, you can't put these type of walls next to buildings or services or things like that which could break or be damaged by the movement because they allow too much movement. They're quite often used for embankments um, because they're well suited. They're, the embankments are usually away from things and so you can build these walls quite, quite easily there. Uh, if you're going to use them for excavations, you need a temporary unsupported excavation. I'll come to that in a minute. So another type of wall is a soil and uh, nail wall or rock bolt wall. And basically these form a gravity block by putting reinforcement into the soil, either soil nails or rock bolts, which hold that together as a block. It's a bit like reinforcing in a, in a, in a reinforced concrete block. So this block here forms a gravity block which holds this soil here. And you can see some examples of things here. So here's a, the, the bottom one is, is rock bolts, and here's the soil nail wall. How these perform is basically it applies, this is your gravity wall, which applies a weight. You have a base friction because of that weight. That force, the restraining force there, is enough to support this active wedge. And of course, you, you would normally provide drainage behind here, such as you don't get hydrostatic pressures as well. The width of the uh, wall needs to generally be about 50 or the base width tends to be, needs to be about 50 or 60 percent of the height of the wall. So you can't get too thin on these things. They need a lot of space. And you, 
in design you check for sliding along the base, overturning, bearing capacity so you're not failing here, the structural capacity of the wall and global stability which is often forgotten. And you should be checking for displacement and settlement but this is rarely done. A second form of passive system is a cantilever wall system and there are several types of this. You can have the counterfoot type wall with precast units or you can have these are basically steel H sections with timber lagging in between. So you can use these for support of embankments or you can use them for support of excavations where again displacements are not of concern because you have to make the excavation before you put the wall in. And of course, again, if you do that, you need a temporary excavation. <coughs> and just looking at this photo here, there is a gentleman down there. And I question the occupational health and safety of someone standing in that gap there. It certainly wouldn't be allowed on a site I would be on. Then we've moved to another form of uh, passive system. <coughs> and this is a system called an embedded cantilever wall, which you put in before you actually dig the excavation. So by putting it in before the excavation, you, can, you protect the workers and you protect your limit movements to a certain extent. And there's several different types of this. Uh, this is a sheet pile wall you've got here. This is a soldier pile wall <coughs> with shockcrete lagging where you put the piles at a spacing. Uh, this is a secant pile wall where you have overlapping piles, hard and soft piles. And this is a diaphragm wall, which is a continuous concrete wall. This is no good in water bearing materials, unless it's in a clay, because water will just come through. You use this type of material in water bearing granular materials, where water can, can flow through, but, uh, but you still tend to get leakage through this. This you use in uh, the same type of ground conditions, where you've got high water tables and granular materials, <coughs> or perhaps soft clays, where you can't allow or you've got to limit the amount of water coming in quite significantly. To, do, to analyse or design these types of wall, you need to do some type of displacement analysis. That's why you're doing an embedded retaining wall, is to limit displacement. So you need to do that type of analysis. It's no good just to do a stability analysis. The earth pressures you get from here, because you, get a relative, you still get a relative uh, amount of movement or more movement, than the next type of retaining wall I'll show you, the earth pressures are relatively close to Ka, just a little bit above Ka. How these work is you basically have the cantilever wall here, you develop an a, a passive earth pressure wedge here, which is resisting the active earth pressure wedge here, and overall you need a depth of embedment which is greater than the retained height. You rarely see, or you should rarely have uh, depth of embedment significantly less than the retained height, uh, simply be, unless you're in rock of some form. Again, you, you're checking the same type of things. You're checking sliding, overturning, lateral bearing capacity, in this case of the soldier pile, so the soldier piles don't move out, uh, the structural strength of the wall and global stability. Again, we need to think about lateral displacement and settlement. Now we move to the more the stiffer types of walls, and this is called an active system because we are actually putting in forces into the wall to try and replicate the forces which the ground was originally applying, those K0 forces. And so these are called embedded walls, but they're anchored or they could be propped by struts. So here you see a diaphragm wall which has got lots of rock anchors in, and these anchors you put in, uh, they're put in place, you then tension them up so you actually pull the wall back as you dig down. Uh, you've got to be very careful with these types of post-tension anchors. If you put too great a force in, you can pull the wall back and you can actually heave the ground behind it and that causes as much damage as settlement. So it must be just right. So the whole idea is you put a restraining force for the post-tensioning, uh, using post-tensioning or the struts to limit the displacement. The stability and movement are important. You're designed to limit ground uh, the stable ground movements while maintaining stability. These have to be designed to carry a higher earth pressure because you're actually putting more pressure back into the wall because you're pulling the wall back into the ground. So you're moving hopefully towards K0 
hopefully not above K0 because you will then cause heave. These you need to use finite element or similar analysis to uh, a high level analysis to understand what the wall is doing. It's very difficult to design these walls without such analysis. And the Earth's pressure distributions you get are very, very complex. So the simplistic mechanism support here is basically the same. It's just a little bit different than before. Here we've got the, the wall. We can usually decrease our embedment length. We're relying on some passive pressure down the bottom to hold the toe of the wall in but most of the support is provided by the anchors. So these are the, the structural elements which provide the support. This is really, the, the retaining wall here is just really a fascia which holds, uh, which allows you to apply these forces and resist these earth pressures. You have to think about drainage and it really depends on what type of wall you're doing. But again, the same type of things have to be considered, always sliding, overturning, lateral bearing capacity, structural, Global stability, in this particular case, because you've got a downward force on the anchors, you also have to think about the bearing capacity of the piles because you can pull the piles into the ground. If we compare the ground movements from all the different types of systems, the stiffest, so I've got two plots here. This is a plot of, of uh, horizontal displacement behind the wall. So this is, if this wall is, say, if the uh, excavation is 10 metres depth, then the movement you're going to get could go back to four times that, which could be 40 metres. And this is the horizontal displacement you can get as a percentage of the, the excavation depth. So 0.1% means you're going to get 10 millimetres displacement for a 10 metre deep wall down to 40 millimetres displacement. And this is a similar plot, except it's settlement. This is behind the wall, so the wall is here, and again up to the uh, say 40 metres behind the wall. And the stiffest types of retaining systems, the active systems are up here. So you can usually get a retaining system which is somewhere around about 0.1%. So that means if you've got a 30 metre deep excavation, it's very hard to stop movements to be less than 30 millimetres. And you need to be aware of that because that has impacts on what's, on what's behind or adjacent structures. As we go to the, the passive embedded systems, you can see the displacement gets greater. And when we go to the passive non-embedded systems, the displacement's even higher again. So if you've got built up areas or you're building a retaining wall close to something, you can't be down here, you must be up here. And so that provides the type of wall you must put in. Now, I could do a whole talk on water and much more than a talk. Basically, no water, your problems are much less. Very few retaining walls fail uh, because of other reasons than water. Water usually either initiates the failure, there might be other reasons behind it, but either usually initiates failure or has a big impact on the failure. So it impacts on everything. It impacts on the stability of the wall, the wall pressures, the soil strength because of suction, uh, the wall movements, the performance of anchors, seepage and so on. I mean, if you think about a retaining wall, a segment pile wall, where you've got anchors in, they could be back in sand, and you've got, a low re you've got a low water table, and the water table rises for some reason, maybe a broken water main or something, then that, the, the resistance of those anchors is going to halve because you actually halve the, uh, the load or the effective stress acting on the anchors. The, so when you've got water problems, the common solution is to provide adequate drainage. But in some cases, you can't provide drainage. Like if you're putting down to water bearing sands, you can't have the water flowing into the basement. You've got to get rid of it. You can't get rid of it. So you've got to provide what's called a tank basement. And that, then you've got to resist buoyant uplift forces and so on. In other cases, you may not be able to do it because there, it's a reactive clay, and if you put a drainage system in behind, it allows water to come in from the surface, uh, moisten up the reactive clay, and then that causes the, the lateral pressures on the wall to increase. And so you can push your wall, and you can end up in trouble. Um, so you need to think about the drainage very, very carefully. So in summary, if I look at fill embankments, these types of, uh, the, well, the retaining walls best suited to fill embankments are gravity and non-embedded cantilever wall systems. They're well suited to these types of situations. 
you get you must remember you do get lateral displacements during field, displace, uh, field placement, but they're usually not of concern because you're far enough away from other structures. If you're close to other structures, then you have to be careful. You must use appropriate backfill materials for the particular wall you're doing with. It's no good if you're designed a wall based on using a select granular fill and you put clay in there. It's not going to work. And just be aware of compaction. You can't underpack, compact, because then the, the material is less, uh, is lower strength than you designed for, and you can't overcompact because you can basically push your wall out. You have to provide adequate drainage, and that's a whole design issue on itself, both surface and subsurface. You have to be aware of bearing capacity and settlement, especially over weaker materials. Just think if you're building a um, a 12 metre high reinforced earth structure and you're on soft clay and you, you, you put your, your lattices back, that whole thing can just fail sideways. Not, by, not suddenly, but can just creep as the soft clay creeps and you can get your, your embankment splitting apart. So you need to think about it. And global stability, quite often people just ignore it completely and it's very important, especially in the softer materials. Excavations, gravity walls, not embedded cantilever walls, tilt up panels, all require bulk excavation prior to wall construction. This is a risk in itself. You can, not only can you get potential instability of that uh, temporary excavation, but you can get large movements or, in ex or movements which are in excess of what you should reasonably allow. They are not suited in close proximity to existing assets. So if you've got a buried water main, you do not do an unsupported excavation next to it. You can break it. Temporary batters, um, common recommendations you'll see in sand, 1H, 1V to 2H, simply because that's all sand will stand up at. If you try to dig it any steeper, it will fail. Clay, you can usually get away with 1V to 1H simply because the clay has suctions in it. And it can stand like that for a little while, not in the long term, but for a little while. In rock, you've got to be careful because the, the batter at which you can stand it up depends on the, uh, the fractures and the bedding and so on in the rock. So when you come along and see temporary excavations, which are up near vertical over five or six metres, that is a very dangerous situation. And, you, and well, I wouldn't be recommending these are the types of values I would recommend. Uh, and I think in a lot of cases, you would actually be uh, outside the occupation of health and safety standards. At these slope angles, you should expect some slumping, especially in wet weather, and you just have to deal with it. The problem is the, with temporary batters is that th these recommendations are often abused, and that puts people's lives at risk and um, uh, assets and so on at risk. You might get away with it, in 99 out of 100 times, but that one time you don't, you could hurt somebody or you could destroy something. So you need to think very carefully about what risk you're taking on. So my plea is to, when you're doing retaining walls, understand the setting you're in, the geological setting, the hydrogeological setting, and the urban setting. Protect existing assets at risk. Just because there's an old building next to you you don't have the right to go and crack or destroy that building. Choose the correct type of retaining wall and apply prudent engineering when you're designing it. Don't be too gung-ho. We have enough cowboys out there, we don't need to join them. Don't put people or assets at risk. Excavation and retention systems are risky business. Give them the attention they need. And don't do this. This was caused by 4.6 metre deep excavation, something we don't want to be involved with. And this is just dangerous. People are killed in trenches every year in Australia. Thank you. Dr Chris Haberfield spent the first 20 years of his career working as an academic for Monash University and is now a Principal Geotechnical Engineer Consultant at Golder Associates. Chris, your work on foundation structure interaction is internationally recognised and includes your work as geotechnical lead for the 1.2 kilometre tall Nikhil Tower in Dubai. Having worked on a vast range of projects over your 15 years in the industry, I'm curious, what's your favourite project and why? Uh, 
I've had a number of very good opportunities, um, but I suppose the one that stands out is the one you just mentioned, which is the Nurkil Tower, simply because it was so far beyond where man had ever gone before. I mean, it's something like 400 metres taller, or was planned to be 400 metres taller than the current tallest building in the world. Uh, a massive structure, and there was just so many challenging engineering problems with it, which just made it such a great project. From your perspective, is it the size of the project, the budget, the, the detailed design, the scale? What gets you excited about a project? The difficulty, the challenges. Uh, I don't care how big the budget is, you can get quite small projects which are very challenging. Uh, so it's, it's all about uh, understanding what the problems are, what the issues are, and coming up with a, a good practical solution uh, that satisfies your client's needs. And if I can do that, it makes it a good project. I mean, you've worked on high rises, you've worked on tunnels, major excavations, mining. How do all those projects compare and, and what are some of the pros and cons as a consultancy for each? Every project you do has its uh, challenges um, and has its, well, as you say, pros and cons. You can't really compare them. You're trying to do, um, to find a solution, as I said. So it's, you can't say one project is better than another. How good a project is really depends on how much freedom, how much um, budget you have to be able to come up with the best solutions you can. If, if a client starts shortchanging you or pushing you very hard to keep down your budget, then you can't deliver the same product as something where you've got more money and more freedom to do, uh, to pursue the best solution for them. Yeah. One of our big problems is that some clients will not want to pay uh, for a good ground investigation. Yeah, we've talked about that, yeah. And the, the problem with that is if we don't have a good ground investigation, we can't do the analysis which is needed to come up with a good solution. We have to be more prudent about it, which is going to cost him more. So I guess would you, would you advise? So would you advise in 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 clients spending the money up front for for companies and consultants like yourself to come up with an economical solution from the from the get go, as opposed to chasing your tail down the track? Absolutely. Um, I, I think the you don't have to go overboard like. Uh, Recently, I did some examples where you could spend an extra, say, $100,000 on an uh, investigation, which was $100,000, so you doubled the cost of the investigation, but you could probably cut three or four million off the price of the foundations alone. Yeah. So it's those types of savings, but because in a lot of cases they come from two different budgets, uh, and in some cases, you know, with the design and construct, it's the builder who has to, to deal with that type of issues rather than the, the, the ultimate client. They just tend to take the smallest, cheapest site investigation they can, and, it, and quite often you have to repeat them. I mentioned in the intro your, your involvement in the Kill Tower in Dubai. What are the challenges of foundation design in, in high-rise buildings? Uh, it depends on the ground conditions. I mean, it's usually reasonably easy to support the weight of the tower uh, because there's usually some type of good ground which is capable of supporting tower under certain loads. The, the conditions become, or the problems become more difficult when you start digging holes uh, for basements and things like that. And it, it's usually uh, groundwater inflow can be a problem. Uh, in deep soft soils, it can be a problem to get out the wind and earthquake loadings, the, the, the lateral loadings, and they will tend to be the most critical condition uh, because you have to get them out through the near the sur near surface soils and they're not very strong. Yeah. So when you start getting very tall towers on soft materials, uh, the engineering foundation becomes very difficult. Um, okay. Both because of groundwater ingress into basements, which you might have there, uh, and because of lateral loads. Having worked extensively in the design of retaining structures, what are the most common issues you see uh, being overlooked in the design stage? To design a retaining wall, you have to understand you're taking a section of ground which is stable and you, you want to cut basically a close to a vertical face in it, giving the soil which is behind that vertical face an opportunity to fail. So you're taking something which is 
from being stable to something which is inherently unstable. And you have to design the structure to hold it there for the next 50 years, 100 years, whatever. If you don't understand the properties of the soil, uh, which is quite often the case, people are optimistic about the properties of soils, or, or even rocks are even worse. They don't see the risks associated with things that can be in the soil, which is quite often hidden risks, but they're, they're foreseeable risks. Uh, that they, they just, the design is poor. Yeah. You can also have a situation where the temporary works to put in a retaining wall haven't been considered properly, like batter slopes, temporary batter slopes for retaining walls can fail um, at quite shallow angles. And if you don't understand the, the soil properties, uh, you can put people's lives at risk just by building the retaining wall. Yeah. A, a lot of retaining wall issues are simply because there's too much movement. It's not necessarily a, a failure, it's, uh, or a, a stability type failure, it's a serviceability type failure where you start cracking buildings and so on behind because people do not estimate displacements very well. Yeah. Um, and the, the big problem is of course water. Yeah. Dealing with water uh, is one of the key problems. If we didn't have to deal with water, we probably wouldn't have a job. Yeah. But we've got to deal with water and people underestimate what water can do. Yeah, well that's my next question. I mean, considering drainage and hydrostatic pressures on retaining walls, what are the, some of the key factors that need to be considered? Well, you've got to, you've, first of all, you've got to understand your soil. I mean, if you've got a clay, there's not a lot of use putting drainage behind the wall simply because hydrostatic pressures can't build up very easily and so you, because there's not a big flow of water. But when you've got a big flow of water, you don't want to have holes in your wall because then you've got to deal with the water. Mm -hmm. So it's understanding what the water will do. So if you want to keep down hydrostatic pressures behind the wall, you've got to provide some type of drainage or, or pressure relief. It's not really drainage, it's pressure relief. Uh, and whereas other situations you need where you've got a lot of water, you don't actually want it to drain. Yep. And so you should be designing for a full hydrostatic pressure. Yep. You then go to the situation where you've got reactive clays and if you start putting drains behind the, the wall, you then provide an opportunity for, the, for surface water to get down into the reactive clays at depth and they can expand and they can cause you lots of problems. Yep. So you, it's all about thinking about what you actually need to do and not just applying some standard design, drainage design, which is in some drawing you've picked off the internet or something. Yeah. Once a retaining structure's been built, what are some of the key aspects that need to be checked to ensure the integrity of the structure long-term? Um, if you build a retaining wall, which is uh, made of durable materials, then there's, there's really not much you need to do. The maintenance is low. You just have to keep, if you've got drainage in, you have to keep the drainage clear. Um, so, and that would be one of the main problems. Uh, I mean, when you put uh, filter material uh, behind a retaining wall, how long does it operate before it starts clogging up and you're getting hydrostatic pressure on it and so on. So if you are worried about walls, you basically are looking for movements. Um, so if you start seeing a wall which starts leaning, uh, it's obvious that it's, it's now um, had, it's been under-designed or there's been some type of um, movement occurred. Whether that wall is unstable or not really depends on um, many factors and more than likely, if it's been laid back a little bit or if it's leaning a little bit, it's probably going to be all right. But it's really about the, the durability of the materials you make the wall from. If they're being compromised, then you need to do something. Okay, so when performing a, a retaining wall design, what likelihood of scenarios do you design for? Well, every retaining wall is different. Um, it depends on what is existing and what you can reasonably foresee. So for instance, if you're building a retention system next to, railway, or to a railway tunnel easement, then you have to design that retaining wall to cater for the impact of future railway tunnels which have to go past. Uh, or if you've got, already got railway tunnels there, then you would have to design it accordingly. But you can't design for something which is not reasonably foreseeable. You can't design for someone who's going to build a 50-storey building next to you. It's up to them to build that building such that it doesn't impact on your retaining wall. <laughs> but equally well, you know, 
there are plenty of services around next to retaining walls. So if you've got a 100-year-old water main, which is sitting behind your wall, should you be designing for the fact if that water main breaks? And